Welcome. My name is Adam Neiman. I am the Artistic Director of the Manchester Music Festival, and I will be your host for this episode of Get to Know the Music. This episode is dedicated to a topical exploration of sonata form. This structure was often the prime choice for composers writing large-scale works, such as sonatas, symphonies, concertos, chamber music works, and more. We will dissect its component parts, evaluate how those parts add up to a balanced structure, and we will further highlight how the various movements within a large-scale sonata interact with one another. Our discussion of sonata form should aptly begin by distinguishing between the technical term sonata allegro form and what we have come to think of as a sonata. When we speak of a sonata, we implicitly refer to an overall compositional format of which we carry certain expectations. Generally speaking, we expect a composition composed of multiple movements, usually three to four, if we're referring to classical or most romantic compositions, with a certain relationship among the movements. In the typical three-movement format, we expect a fast, slow, fast, relationship. The last movement is usually lighthearted, with less dramatic content than the first movement, and the slow movement is usually the most heartfelt and introspective of the three. In the typical four-movement format, we expect a fast, slow, medium, fast relationship with the middle two movements sometimes in the reverse, depending on the composer's preference. Usually the medium-paced movement is a dance of some form, or a scherzo, which evolved from the earlier minuet and trio form. Though it is tempting to reduce our understanding of the sonata to the aforementioned stereotypes, the truth is more complicated. The form that we have come to expect as a sonata is a form that was perpetually in flux, typifying gradually across the Baroque and classical periods. The Romantic period saw, to a degree, a continuation of this stereotype, though composers like Beethoven, Liszt, and eventually Strauss and Debussy took great liberties in expanding and contracting the format into something more effective for their particular modes of expression. The metamorphosis of the sonata is something that continues to the present day. Sonata form, also known as sonata allegro form or first movement form, is known academically as a strategic assembly of musical areas based on the fundamental tenets of balance and symmetry. Strictly speaking, the technical term sonata form really only deals with the first movements of sonatas as we have come to know them. To comprehend how this structure functions, we will delve into the precise components that formulate this structure presently. We will take a brief look at the Baroque binary form that preceded the advent of sonata allegro form so that we can fully understand why the form expanded in scope and breadth of dramatic content. When we speak of most large-scale compositions within the context of the Manchester Music Festival, you may not have previously realized that we are actually referring to sonatas as whole compositions. To be clear, sonata form, when referring to a solo instrument, is typically entitled sonata. Well, that's simple enough. When written for a small chamber ensemble, it is typically entitled according to the number of players, for example, duet, trio, quartet, 
etc. The title might contain the further clarification piano quintet or string quartet, referring, in the case of the piano quintet, to the presence of a single piano along with a quartet of string or wind players, and the string quartet referring to the specific combination of two violins, one viola, and one cello, unless otherwise specified. Aside from these instrumental specifications, the format is typically a sonata for the combination of instruments. When scored for orchestra, it is typically entitled symphony. When composed for a solo instrument or a group of solo instruments with orchestra, it is typically entitled concerto. It's quite amazing to think about the fact that the sonata idiom is a common denominator of all these commonly heard categories of works. Again, I am speaking stereotypically. There are many exceptions, of course, as well as many other widely used structural formats other than the sonata. Nonetheless, many composers found the idiom of the sonata with its typical multi-movement structure to be advantageous to their expressive needs. Before we proceed to a formal analysis, let us briefly listen to an excerpt of the opening movement of the Mozart Piano Sonata in F Major, Kirschel 280. We will come back to that movement toward the end of our episode, with the printed score following the recording that highlights all the structural elements we will soon discuss. And by the way, if you're curious about who the pianist is, it is yours truly, Adam Neiman. This is from my long ago recorded debut disc, Live from Tokyo. Let's listen. To begin our analytical dive into form, let's take a brief look at binary form, which in many ways serves as the foundation of sonata allegro form. We typically come across binary compositions in the form of dance movements within Baroque dance suites, and some of the early examples of sonatas composed in southern Germany in the 1730s included such movements. Though there are a large number of binary forms, we will concern ourselves today with the so-called three-phrase pattern, which elucidates the link with later sonata allegro form. Let's examine this diagram closely to understand what it symbolizes. The letters A and B are used to denote areas of the work which might be characterized by melodies, themes, or just general passages with a certain feeling to them. I want you to notice the double line in the middle with a pair of vertical dots to either side of the double line. These dots are the musical symbol for repeat. 
What this means is that the initial A area is played twice. Then the second B followed by A area, meaning the second half, is subsequently played twice as well. The repeat sign marks the halfway point through the piece. The material marked in blue represents harmonic relationships. The scope of this episode is not sufficient to cover a full-fledged survey of harmony, but suffice it to say, for your present understanding of the form, that one represents the home key, the key that the work is set in. In binary form, the first half, the A section, ends either in the same home key, one, or modulates to the five. When we say five, we literally mean the major chord built upon the fifth scale degree. In other words, if you play a scale in the home key, stop on the fifth note and build a major chord on top of that note, you would produce the five chord of the home key. A cadence, simply put, represents coming to a temporary or concluding resting point within a composition. So, in the A section, the material is initially presented within the home key for a while, then comes to rest or cadence on either the root chord, meaning in the home key, or upon the five chord. This whole section is then repeated so we experience it twice. The second half, the section containing the letters B followed by a return to A, represents an area of harmonic movement or what we call modulation. Typically, the second half begins on the five chord, cadences on either that same harmony or modulates, travels to the six chord then resolves to the one chord to conclude the half. This closure upon our home key returns us from the area of travel represented by the key changes in the B area. This whole section is then repeated, so we also experience it twice. What is important to understand about binary form is that in the macro picture, the first half modulates harmonically very little, so it represents an area of relative harmonic stability. The second half harmonically modulates more than the first half, starting away from the home key, migrating possibly to the sixth or even another more ambiguous key, before returning home to one. The purple lines in my diagram indicate the destabilizing elements that create tension in the work, while the orange line indicates the return to home key, and thus the release of tension. The hierarchy I have diagrammed uses lowercase letters a and b in white to represent the short-term areas while the capital letters A and B in green represent the two large-scale halves of the work. Notice the lengths of the halves are equivalent. Therefore, the form is symmetrical. This is an important value of the binary system, this equivalency, and that proportion became the main focus of metamorphosis as composers evolved the sonata allegro form beyond its binary roots. Now we come to sonata allegro form, also known as first movement form, as it is commonly employed for the substantial first movements of classical and romantic sonatas. Keep in mind what we just surveyed regarding binary form, the symmetry of the halves, the stability of the first half followed by the instability of the initial second half, 
concluding with full resolution. Essentially, Sonata Allegro form achieves a similar result, but with an expanded scope and somewhat altered proportion. The three main areas, what had been marked as lowercase a and a followed by b in the binary form diagram, are referred to in this context as exposition, development, and recapitulation. What had functioned as the first half of the binary form is now the exposition of the Sonata Allegro structure. It is so named to clarify that it exposes or initially presents all of the important material around which the movement is constructed. Important attributes of the exposition are the modulation away from the home key, at some point, the exposition establishes the five and subsequently reaffirms the five so as to really emphasize to the listener that the music has traveled from one place to another. It will travel through a number of thematic areas. When I say theme, I mean a motive or melody, typically two to three thematic areas, Though there is no dogma surrounding this, some sonatas have only two themes, some have as many as four or five. It all depends on the scope of the work and the composer's style. Generally speaking, the themes serve to contrast one another, generating varied emotional and psychological states within the music. In between the various themes, the gaps can be filled with what we call episodic material, namely material that can be textural, like virtuosic passages, or restatements of fragments of previous themes. Think of these areas like the drywall and insulation that conceal the gaps between the studs and posts of your house frame. The development section is so named because it develops the material presented in the exposition. It serves a number of main functions. It destabilizes the structure of the work by modulating to foreign key areas and eventually settling upon the five. The five chord is the most closely related chord to the one. Again, this episode cannot cover in depth a full analysis of harmony, so please take my word for it. Given this close relationship, the five chord sets up the return of the home key, the one, therefore leading us seamlessly to the recapitulation, which I will get to momentarily. Thematically, the development section is a repository for the composer's ingenuity and cleverness. The composer will often deconstruct the exposition themes, variating them with clever techniques such as retrograde, meaning playing them backwards, augmentation, meaning slowing them down, diminution, meaning speeding them up, and fragmentation, meaning cutting them into little parts. The composer may also alter the tone or mode of the themes, turning major into minor, for example, or vice versa, or converting a happy theme to a sad one, etc. The development section is commonly an area to display the virtuosity of the performer, and the dramatic flair of the composition is elevated by all of the aforementioned techniques. Seamlessly, and through the firm establishment of the five key, or what we call the dominant, the work recapitulates, meaning says it all again. In the recapitulation section, the home key is reestablished, the mood and character are stabilized after all that chaos of the development, and the recapitulation brings the work to a conclusive finish, either by simple strong cadences on the one, the home key, 
or through an added coda section that serves to bolster the feeling that things have come to a satisfying conclusion. Most, if not all, the exposition's themes are replayed during the recapitulation, though the order of the themes restated need not necessarily follow the same order of presentation as within the exposition. The main thing is that the composer ordinarily stays fairly close to the home key, and the composer may feel totally free to omit certain themes if deemed unnecessary for restatement. Often, composers do omit or reduce the length of the themes in the recapitulation in order for the length of the movement to not exceed the composer's sense of proportion. This is particularly true when the development section is extensive and rigorous. Many classical and even some romantic sonatas indicate that the performer should repeat both halves of the movement, though common performance practice dictates the inclusion of a first half repeat, but the omission of a second half repeat. The main reason for this performance practice is symmetry. By repeating the exposition, the first half of the work, meaning the exposition times two, is roughly equivalent in length to the entirety of the development and recapitulation combined. Two balanced halves to create a harmonious whole, in keeping with Sonata Allegro's roots as a binary form. So, to recapitulate our survey, let's compare those diagrams directly to one another. Binary form and Sonata Allegro form. Though there are some differences and the scopes are different, they both provide symmetrical halves with stability as a hallmark of the first half, instability at the outset of the second half, and eventually resolution at the final portion of the second half. Slow movements of sonatas serve two main goals, to change the narrative perspective of the work from the more third-person objective standpoint of the fast movements to that of a first-person subjective standpoint. The slow movement provides ample space for deep contemplative expression, and thus a slow movement often serves as the emotional epicenter of a sonata. Its placement is quite variable according to expressive need. Typically, in a three-movement sonata, the slow movement is placed in between the outer movements. In a four-movement sonata, it may be placed either second or third, but there are some wonderful examples of slow introductions to first movements as a substitute for a full-fledged slow movement. Alternatively, a slow introduction to a final movement may serve the same function. It is a rare sonata indeed that lacks any semblance of a slow movement. Without going into too much detail, the common forms for slow movements are often slow movement sonata form, which derives from the typical form of the 18th century operatic aria, a slow dance, and the example to follow, the movement is based on a Sicilian rhythm, or a more freeform fantasia or recitative, another derivation from the world of opera, where the plot line moves forward through a type of sing-speech combination in between the arias. Let us listen now to a portion of the second movement of the same Mozart piano sonata that we heard earlier. 
See if you can identify the overall mood and contemplative character that I just outlined. Notice how different this movement is from the lively and joyous first movement excerpt I played earlier. Menuet and trio movements are often interchangeable with scherzo movements, serving as a light-hearted palate cleanser. Given that the menuet is a courtly dance, these movements typically eschew overt seriousness and complexity, aiming instead to provide a respite from the drama of the other movements. Generally, they are placed second or third in a four-movement sonata, and scherzos follow the same format as menuet and trios do, though they are typically faster and more virtuosic. By the way, scherzo is the Italian word for joke. The format of these types of movements generally combines two binary forms together. The A section is an initial binary form menuet, which carries a dance flavor and contains the typical expected repeats. The subsequent trio section is also binary with repeats, and the character usually contrasts that of the menuet. After the trio section is completed, the menuet is played again, most often without the repeats. I won't be playing a musical excerpt of such a movement because the Mozart sonata in F major that we have been listening to is cast in only three movements without a menuet and trio movement. Nevertheless, you have undoubtedly encountered this type of movement many times during the festival, so now you know how it is assembled. Finales are designed to bring the entire work to a satisfying close, and depending on the mood of the work in general, they may be characteristically fast and exciting, or alternatively pastoral and folksy. One thing is for sure, final movements tend to be less complex and emotionally tense than any of the other movements, although some composers choose to cast them in full-fledged sonata allegro form or a similar format called sonata rondo form, which can involve a full development and recapitulation, as well as a coda section. More typically, however, the chosen form for many of these finales is the more simple rondo form, as follows. A, B, A, 
C A B A. If you look carefully, you can see that there are two sets of A B A sections divided by a middle C section, which can sometimes serve as an extended development section in the case of a sonata rondo form. In the simpler rondos, the sections tend to oscillate fairly briskly, and the movements are often short and sweet. Apropos, let's listen to an excerpt of the third and final movement of the Mozart Piano Sonata in F major, Kerschel 280, a typical example of rondo form. Now that we have surveyed the structure of a sonata and sonata form, let us listen in full to the first movement of the Mozart Sonata in F major, Kerschel 280. I have annotated the score for your perusal during the performance, and the various sections we discussed will animate in real time as you listen and watch. Even if you can't read music, you can still hear and feel the various areas of the structure, and you can fully comprehend the beautiful symmetry and grace of this marvelous work.
Thank you so much for joining me on this journey. I've so enjoyed talking to you about sonata form, an important and representative structure that underpins so many of the wonderful compositions we program at the Manchester Music Festival. I sincerely hope that this elevates your appreciation when listening to such works in the future and I encourage you to come back as many times as you would like to this episode of Get to Know the Music. See you next time!